Have you wanted to play a druid who was actually good in melee combat? No, I'm not talking moon druid. Maybe you want to play an eldritch knight. Or wonder if you could build a barbarian that was more wise than they were strong. Well, today we are going to do all of the above. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into character builds for our favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you like the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build something in the hopes of creating a character that is both really powerful, but also really fun to play in game. So if you enjoy creating characters for your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you are just looking for tips or ideas ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. And I'm so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby. I release character build videos every Tuesday. So I hope that you will like and comment and subscribe to the channel if you haven't and even ring the notifications bell so that you never miss an episode. Today, I want to talk about Spores Druids. When Spores Druids were first being tested for Dungeons and Dragons in their Unearthed Arcana version for the uninitiated, that's what Wizards of the Coast calls something when it's in like beta mode, test mode, right? Unearthed Arcana. The key feature for Spores Druids Symbiotic Entity gave you temporary hit points and an extra d6 of damage on every melee weapon attack. Awesome. It felt like the druids were finally getting like a gish option, right? A spell sword. My favorite kind of characters to build and play. In my excitement, I made this amazing, I thought, monk uh, grappler build using that subclass, and it ended up doing more damage than almost any other build that I had done to date. To be fair, it was fairly early on in the channel's history, but regardless. An extra d6 of damage might not seem like a lot, but when it applies to every single hit and you can find a way to make a lot of attacks on your turn, it definitely adds up. Especially since, like Hex or Hunter's Mark, which also add a d6 of damage, with this you didn't have to keep spending a bonus action to like continue transferring the effect over to a different target once you're current target died, right? But then they released the Spores Druid officially, and after testing, they had made one very big change that I won't say ruined it, but it definitely nerfed its power. They made it so that the extra damage that you got from Symbiotic Entity only lasted so long as the temporary hit points that it gave lasted as well. And so Spores Druid went from a pretty decent two level dip, considering the other benefits that you can get from first level Druid spells and things, right? Wild Shape, etc., to a much less attractive two level dip. It felt like you kinda had to commit pretty hard to lots of druids if you expect that damage to stick around for a while. And I don't fault Wizards of the Coast for trying to make staying with a single class more appealing. Not at all. But here's the big problem. If you're going to give a class a gishy spell sword option, you've got to also give them extra attack. Failure to do so just makes any features that you're giving them to help them be more viable in melee feel really like weak and lackluster. Warlocks get the Thirsting Blade invocation to deal with this. Half casters like Paladins and Rangers get extra attack. If you want to be a Bard spell sword, you can go Valor or Swords for extra attack. If you want to be a Wizard subclass, right, you can go Bladesinger in D&D or in Baldur's Gate with mods. Uh, as I demonstrated a couple weeks ago. But druids, and for that matter clerics, they're kind of left in the lurch. Now, clerics make up for it a bit with some really nice spells like spirit guardians and spiritual weapon, but druids, especially in Baldur's Gate 3, are left without much. An extra d6 of damage, sure, but it's not worth a whole lot if I don't have good armor proficiency, it, don't even get me started on the druid's prohibition against metal armor in D&D that thankfully was nixed in Baldur's Gate, and can only make one measly weapon attack with a quarterstaff on my turn or something. It feels like a, I guess if you have nothing else better to do, here's a teeny bit of extra damage feature than something to really build around, right? That said, it hasn't stopped me from using the subclass in a lot of builds on my channel, it just frustrates me that I feel like I have to invest at least five levels into another class first if I'm going to do so. 
But the way I figure it, if you're going to try and take advantage of Spores Druid as it exists in the game currently, you need to either just dip into it, but then do everything you can to avoid ever getting hit, or commit to Druid as much as you can, at least once you get extra attack. But try and do so in a way that will still extend the life of your temporary hit points as much as possible. So I have yet to use Spores Druid in any of my Baldur's Gate 3 builds to date, and today is the day that I'm going to remedy that. For those of you who don't play Baldur's Gate and wish I would just go back to doing nothing but Dungeons and Dragons videos, know that by and large, these builds today will work perfectly fine in your tabletop game as well. All right, preamble done. Let's get into Baldur's Gate 3, episode nine, um, building with spores, playing with mushrooms. How about we be a little more direct? The Eldritch Knight and the wise barbarian. But first, a quick word from the sponsor for the video this week, Che Peku. So if you guys don't know who Che Peku are, then you are really missing out. They are, quite frankly, some of the best TTRPG map makers in the world. And with 20,000 patrons, they are the number one RPG creator on Patreon. Awesome. To date, they've created over 4,000 hand-drawn maps that you can use in D&D, Pathfinder, or whatever game you might be playing at your table, and they are gorgeous. They're super high res with map options for every conceivable environment and game setting, whether you're looking for a classic dungeon crawl or something more offbeat like a kobold brewery or a giant elder brain skull, right? Today, I wanted to tell you guys about the latest thing that they're doing for their maps, and it's this. They're adding what they call scenes. How many times has your party come upon a new environment or a scene and while you've maybe got some well-written text to describe what your characters are seeing, you don't really have a great visual to add to that scene. Well, Chepeku is here to fix that. They've added tons of really gorgeous, like on the ground perspective, cinematic views of their maps. So that before you jump into the top down grid version, right, you get a feel for what your character is seeing. And it just really makes the experience that much more immersive. And getting access to their maps is super simple. You just support them on Patreon. There are a couple of different options for doing so. There's a $1 per map option, which gets you like basic day and night VTT compatibility compatible digital battle maps. And then there's a $5 per map option that gets you access to all map variations, as well as music that may accompany it, animations, and even Foundry VTT modules. Now, best of all, when you sign up to support them on Patreon, you automatically get access to their entire existing backlog. You're not charged for anything that they've already created. You can just download it. You're only charged for new stuff that comes out going forward. And you can cancel at any time with no strings attached. This is such an incredibly generous business model. You should take advantage. To do so, just go to uh, chepeku.com and you know, if you like what you see, which I'm sure you will, then go to their Patreon at patreon.com slash chepeku and show them some love. Everyone at your table will thank you for it. All right, huge thanks to Chepeku. You guys are the best. Let's jump into the builds. So build number one, first up, we're going to explore the do everything in your power not to get hit so that you can hold on to that extra spores druid damage build. I think the fighter is the perfect chassis for going that route, and no fighter class is better at not getting hit than the Eldritch Knight. I also have yet to use the Eldritch Knight subclass in a build for Baldur's Gate, so this felt like the perfect opportunity to do so. Let's explore why. At level 1, for our starting class, yes, we're going to start off fighter here. And for our starting abilities, I'm gonna recommend that we go with a 17 strength, a 16 constitution, and a 14 wisdom. I'm not planning on getting any half feats with this build. I'm just going to assume that we're getting a plus one to our strength fairly early on in the campaign from the hag. And I don't wanna spoil anything. You might not do this for role-playing purposes. You might decide to make a different choice, or you might have missed that, right? Regardless, I think I think it's safe to say that it's the route that most people today are taking when they play the game, so this will eventually then let us get to an 18 strength, right? Adjust accordingly if you make a different decision. As for our equipment, eventually we're going to want to get to the best heavy armor possible and our two favorite one-handed melee weapons. Yes, my plan with this character is to make them a dual wielder, but I'll explain why in a minute. Until level 4, feel free to just go sword and board with a shield if you'd rather, or even even a two-handed weapon for that matter. At Fighter 1 then we get Second Wind, which lets us heal ourselves with a bonus action once per short rest, and then we get a fighting style. And in the interest of prepping for Spores Druid later and the not getting hit thing, I'm gonna say let's go with the defense fighting style here to add one to our armor class. But honestly, if it were me playing 
this character in this game, I might go with the two weapon fighting style here instead and then possibly respec later. As a reminder, anyone can dual wield one handed weapons in game and then use the weapon in your offhand to make an attack with your bonus action so long as the weapons are light weapons, right? Short swords, scimitars, etc. But that bonus action attack doesn't add the damage from your strength modifier, in our case, unless you have the two weapon fighting fighting style. Feel free to go defense or TWF, but I'd personally make sure that I had defense at least once I hit Sports Druid. At level 2, fighters get Action Surge, yes, infinitely useful, both for more attacks later and some burst damage, right? Or, once we have them, to like cast a spell first and then still be able to make attacks on our turn, etc, etc. One of the strongest abilities in the game, and I use it all the time, so you already know this. At level 3, fighters get their subclass, and yes, like I've said, we are going to go with Eldritch Knight. Eldritch Knights are sort of like the original Gish in D&D 5e anyways. Eventually they kind of got outshone in that department with the release of subclasses like the Hexblade, the Swords Bard, the Bladesinger Wizard, right? But Eldritch Knights are still quite good, despite the kind of power creep of subclasses that were introduced later on. The biggest downside to them, in my opinion, is that they are what we would call like one-third casters. Paladins and Rangers are half casters, right? They gain new spell levels and spell slots at half the level of a full caster, like a Sorcerer, Cleric, Wizard. And Eldritch Knights, as well as uh, Arcane Trickster Rogues, actually, gain spells and spell slots at one-third the speed. So we don't get second level spells until seventh level, which is pretty painful. And even then, most of the spells that we get, all but one of them at this level, are restricted by the abjuration and evocation schools. They have to be part of those schools. Now, those are not bad schools of spells, right? But still, it just makes it even that much more restrictive. For that reason, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to play an Eldritch Knight like a true, like, spell belly spell sword, slinging spells and making weapon attacks all the time. You just don't have the spell slots to do so, nor the ability scores to make both your weapon attacks and your spell casting as effective as they could be. So yeah, I just kind of dump our intelligence ability score, which is what we need for more potent spells, right? Valuing things that will just make me better in combat. Thus, when we take our spells here, be sure to just grab stuff that works regardless of your low intelligence. Of course, you can always get the headband of intellect fairly early on, but that's still not going to change the fact that we have too few spell slots to just be casting them willy-nilly, right? Thus, I think Magic Missile is a perfect choice for us since it just hits the target without any roll or save and can be a nice way to finish off like one really low hit point enemy from range even if we needed to and still do damage to like a second or even potentially third target. But the most important spell for us here for this build of course is shield. D&D veterans know that while there are lots of cool things about being a fighter who can cast spells, the thing that makes Eldritch Knights kind of amazing is the spell that they are casting more than any other, shield. You cast shield as a reaction when you get hit and it raises your armor class by a whopping 5 until your next turn, potentially causing that attack and many others to miss. In fact, some people even like to describe Eldritch Knights as fighters who can cast shield. And that is not a bad thing, honestly. At level 4, we get our first feat. and so so here's the thing, to really take advantage of that extra d6 from Spores Druid, we want to attack as often as possible while still holding on to those temporary hit points that we get, as we've said, right? We need extra attack, yes, but we also want to do everything we can to get an attack from our bonus action as well. There are, of course, a few ways to do that. If I were building this character for D&D, I would use a spear and a shield and take the Polearm Master feat at this level, just like I did with my uh, Oathbreaker Paladin build a while ago, because Polearm Master would give us a bonus action attack with like the blunt end of a spear, yes, even if we're wielding it with one hand. It's not just polearms, right? And that way we could get that really sweet plus two to our armor class from a shield and still be making, eventually anyways, three attacks on our turn. The problem is, to my great frustration, Polearm Master is still broken in Baldur's Gate 3, at the time of this recording, at least. Three months after release. You get your bonus action attack from the feat, sure, but it's not adding 
almost any of the extra damage things that you're supposed to get from making an attack with that weapon. It doesn't work with Pact of the Blade properly, or Rage, or Great Weapon Master if you're using a Halberd or a Glaive, or yes, after testing, it's also not adding the extra damage from Spores Druid. So, until they fix it at least, we'll rely on to weapon fighting for our bonus action attack instead. This prevents us from using a shield, yes, but that's okay. We'll take the consolation prize of the dual wielder feat and be pretty happy about it, actually. Dual wielder not only lets you dual wield weapons that aren't light, so knock yourself out now with two long swords or battle axes or even stabs, right? Or mix and match. And that's gonna generally add a small damage bump going from, you know, probably a D6 short sword to like a D8 weapon instead. But then it also, quite nicely, gives us a plus one to our armor class when we're dual wielding. So yeah, it's a little bit of a compromise compared to a shield and polearm master, giving us both a little more damage and a little more defense. You know what? I think the dual wielder feat is quite a bit stronger in Baldur's Gate than it is in D&D. I mean, going from a short sword to a long sword is only a D6 to a D8, which is only one more damage on average, right? But in Baldur's Gate 3, there are so many amazing magic weapons. The place is just lousy with them. And a lot of them are incredibly powerful, but not necessarily light. So getting this feat, it really opens things up for our character to just go crazy with whatever weapon combo we want. And because we're a strength-based character here, we don't even care if they're finesse weapons or not, right? It makes this build especially feel like a true weapon master character. They're just kind of a Swiss army knife, right? Whichever weapon you have that's the most powerful, that's the one you're using. And you're good with it. And I don't know, that's a really fun concept to play with. But at level five, yes, we get extra attack, so now we can make two attacks when we take the attack action on our turn, as well as that third bonus action attack with our offhand. At level six, I am tempted to go druid here now that we have extra attack, but fighters uniquely get an extra feat at level six. So I'm going to say let's go fighter six first so that we can take a feat, bump our strength, capping it at 20 here, assuming, like I said, that we got the plus one from the hag. Even if you didn't, we're going to want to bump strength here, right? Now, if you've done something in the game or found equipment or have lots of giant strength elixirs so that you don't need this strength bump, then yeah, I think I would start taking druid levels here. But for us, at level seven, yeah, it's time for druid levels. And as a druid one then, we get spells, first of all. And, you know, I'm just going to go with the usual suspects here, picking up like the best support options. Guidance for an extra d4 on ability checks, healing word for a ranged heal with our bonus action. Goodberry is not a bad option for healing, it's pretty efficient. And yeah, if nobody else in your party has it, grab Longstrider here. You cast it as a ritual so it doesn't actually take up any of your spell slots, you can cast it on your entire party, it lasts for the whole day, doesn't take concentration, and just gives everybody an extra 10 feet of move speed, which is always handy. At level 8, you would be a druid 2, and that means we get a lot of stuff. First up, Wild Shape. This gives us two uses of Wild Shape per short rest that we can use to change into a beast from a limited selection. And sure, that itself brings a lot of fun and useful abilities. I mean, I really love how Baldur's Gate 3 has kind of gone out of their way to like make little crawl holes and spaces and things that only like a wild shaped druid or maybe uh, like a pet, a familiar or something could get through to find like a back door into an area or explore a place that you never would be able to explore otherwise. It makes you feel really cool for investing a couple levels into the class. But of course we will primarily be using our wild shape charges for something else because yeah, druids get their subclass at level two and yes, Yes, of course, we're taking Spores Druid. Spores Druids get two features here. Halo of Spores is pretty lame, honestly. It lets you use your reaction to do a d4 of damage to an enemy, no bonuses to that, and they also get to make a constitution saving throw that they'll likely succeed on. I'd maybe never use this, especially on this character where we're not bumping our wisdom a lot, right? Because that's the DC against which the characters are going to be making their saving throw. Unless I was just really confident that I wasn't going to need my reaction for anything better. And I mean, like, I guess if we're out of spell slots, so we know we're not going to be using shield, right? Or maybe an enemy only has like two hit points left and we really need him to die. But the other feature, the good one, is yes, symbiotic entity. As I've kind of talked about, lets you use a charge of your wild shape as an action to gain four temporary hit points per druid level. And so long as you have at least one of those temporary hit points left, your melee attacks, including unarmed strikes, do an extra d6 of necrotic damage. Nice. You're not always going to be able to hold on to those temporary hit points, but I mean, even without magic items, 
right now. With plate armor, the defensive fighting style, and the dual wielder feat, we're sitting at a 20 armor class. That means with magic items, you're likely somewhere between like 22 to 24. And you have the shield spell, so potentially like 27 to 29 AC. Most enemies are not going to hit you unless they crit. And I mean, you can even get items that prevent enemies from critting you. In that case, they would still hit you, it just wouldn't be a double damage hit, right? That said, of course, yeah, there are spellcasters and other ways to take damage out of just something making an attack against our armor class. What that means then is focus down those spellcasters first if you weren't doing that already. Even if it means like running past enemies that are gonna be taking opportunity attacks against you, they're very unlikely to hit you with their opportunity attack regardless, so yeah, beeline for those casters. Also, I almost forgot my favorite thing about Symbiotic Entity in Baldur's Gate versus D&D. It lasts until your temporary hit points expire or your next long rest. Ugh. Thank you, Larian. Man, it's nice not having to worry about trying to anticipate exactly when combat is gonna break out and just using it right at the beginning of the day or at the end of a short rest and then just moving on. And yeah, don't forget, we do get two uses of Wild Shape per short rest. So there's no reason that you couldn't recast this in combat once it drops off if you really wanted or needed to, but it does require our action. So most of the time it's probably not worth it. But now that we've got Spores Druid at level nine, I wanna go back to Fighter. That would make us a Fighter seven and as as an Eldritch Knight, that means we get War Magic. This feature isn't great, to be honest. It tells us that if we cast a cantrip with our action, we can make a weapon attack with our bonus action. Now, if we had the option to cast a full slotted spell and then make a weapon attack, it'd be pretty nice once in a while, but especially for those of us who are dual wielding, in Baldur's Gate 3, and I sometimes forget about this, you don't have to take the attack action in order to make an offhand bonus attack action, right? So in BG3, this adds almost nothing nothing for us. We could cast a spell with our action and then still make a bonus action attack if we're dual wielding. It's really only good if like we're using a two-handed weapon or like a sword and board or something, right? Or if like our main hand weapon is just way better than our offhand weapon. Anyway, it's very rare that you're going to be better off with a cantrip action or even a spell slot action for that matter and then just a single weapon attack bonus action. For what it's worth, they are currently planning on changing this in 1D&D to basically mimic the blade singer's extra attack where once you get extra attack one of those attacks can be replaced with a cantrip that's way better of course here's hoping that planned change sticks and who knows maybe larian even adopts it but we also do get yes second level wizard spells here as an eldritch knight and again at this level they have to be abjuration and evocation spells and with our crappy intelligence even if we have the headband of intellect it's only going to be a plus three to our intelligence modifier it's never going to be great i'd still say let's focus on taking spells that just work regardless so gust of wind could come in handy to like clear away poisonous gases and things maybe even knock people off cliffs if they have a really bad saving throw. Darkness too can be really useful even if you don't have an ability to see inside of it like Devil's Sight or something. In BG3, I like to cast it on my ranged characters. On their turn, they pop out, fire their shots, and then run back inside of it. The AI is particularly bad at dealing with the darkness spell in this game. In D&D, enemies could still try to hit you if you are inside the darkness, they just have disadvantage for doing so. In BG3, ranged attacks can't even be made into the darkness, and melee enemies rarely will run inside of it. So most of the time, if you're inside of that darkness bubble, you might as well be invincible. It's a really great defensive spell for your squishier allies. At level 10, we would be a fighter eight, and that means we get another feat. I would probably either go with a bump to our constitution, taking it to 18, or maybe the sentinel feat. It stops enemies from moving if you hit them with an opportunity attack, which is nice, but then it also lets you use your reaction to make an attack against an enemy who attacks a nearby ally. And, you know, that would apply all of the things that our weapon attacks apply, including that spores damage. So yeah, it can be a nice additional source of damage, but it does come at the cost of our reaction, which would mean no shield spell for us that round, which could ultimately hurt your damage more if it led to us losing our temporary hit points, right? Worth considering, but not a no-brainer. But the main reason I wanted to get to Fighter 8 actually was because Eldritch Knights can get a non-evocation abjuration second level spell here, and that means we can grab Enlarge Reduce. You know, I've not taken this spell often enough, 
in my builds. I mean, it lets us grow large in size, which in and of itself is awesome because it natively increases our reach, right? Because we're just bigger on the battlefield. But then it also gives us an extra D4 of damage on all of our attacks. And while that's not a ton, again, if we're making three attacks per turn, it adds up, especially if we're using Action Surge and getting five. It's almost as much damage as we're getting from Spores Druid, and I like it a lot more than Hex or Hunter's Mark since it's a buff on us, not a debuff on enemies that we have to keep transferring, right? Once we cast it, we just get an extra D4, doesn't matter who we're hitting. So at levels 11 and 12 on this build, I think I'd probably finish it off with Paladin. This would let us pick up some additional support options, it would get us another fighting style, and at this point, yes, you definitely want to respec, take two weapon fighting from fighter, and then the defense fighting style from Paladin because they don't have two weapon fighting style access. And then of course, yes, Divine Smite. So now you can add a ton of extra damage on demand with all those spell slots that you're not using for shield. So yeah, that's the Eldritch Knight version of making good use of Spores Druid. With the two weapon fighting style in larger Reduce and Symbiotic Entity all active, we're potentially doing 3d8 from the weapon, 3d6 for Symbiotic Entity, and 3d4 from Enlarge Reduce, plus 15 damage round after round by level 10. That's what, 46, 47 damage per round sustainably, and that's like without haste being on you or any magic items or weapons, while simultaneously being all but unhittable, and bringing a small cadre of minor support options with you to boot. The build was a lot of fun to play in test. I hope you have a chance to see that for yourself. Okay, let's move on to the what if we want to invest more levels into Spores Druid so that we can be more tanky and hold on to those temporary hit points longer version of playing with mushrooms. So yes, trying not to get hit is definitely one way to make the Spores Druid work, but stacking those temporary hit points higher while also getting resistance to damage is another great way. And the way we do that, of course, is with some Barbarian Rage. Now, in D&D, this can get a little wonky. I mean, I have done a Barbarian Spores Druid build on my channel before, the Spore Beast, I think I called it, and it actually worked quite well, honestly. But what it didn't really allow for is a decent wisdom score so that you can take advantage of those nice druid spells and support capabilities, right? But here's one big and fantastic difference between BG3 and D&D. In D&D, Reckless Attack and Rage, arguably the most important and powerful features of a Barbarian, only grant benefits to your attacks if you're making strength-based weapon attacks. In BG3, that requirement is just gone. You get extra damage from Rage so long as they are melee or thrown weapon attacks, and Reckless Attack gives advantage on all attacks on your turn so long as the first time you use Reckless Attack, you're making a melee attack. Regardless, there's no strength requirement for either. And this really opens up the door to doing some things differently with Barbarians. You could go dexterity-based and maybe focus on finesse weapons and get a really great armor class, right? Or even like charisma-focused, grabbing pack the blade from Warlock and be a raging yet charming Berserker. Or even, as we'll show today, a wise and sagacious Barbarian. Maybe, and, and I think of this maybe more like a World of Warcraft shaman type character or something. And I love having more build options. This will hopefully let us, eventually anyways, be a really nice melee damage dealer who's also super tanky and brings some really great utility and support options with them too. Super well-rounded, super versatile, let's dive in. At level one, for this build, I want our starting class to be Druid. You certainly wouldn't have to, but I see this character as valuing their tankiness and support capabilities at least as much as their melee capabilities. And though this is going to delay our extra attack, I think we'll get enough damage from other features that it'll make it feel like a nice well-rounded character right from the beginning, which is great. For our starting abilities then, I'm going to say let's go 17 Wisdom, 16 Constitution, and a 14 Dexterity, again assuming that we're getting that plus one to Wisdom from the Hag so that we'll have an 18. As for equipment on this character, eventually we're going to want to get to the best medium armor possible, a shield, and then a staff as our weapon of choice because yes, we also get spells at this level and druids get access to that wonderful cantrip, Shillelagh, which lets us use a bonus action to make our staff do a d8 of damage regardless of what it's normally supposed to be, and then also use our wisdom modifier for our plus to hit and damage with that staff instead of our strength. Unfortunately, it only lasts for a minute, but Thankfully, in BG3, you almost always can anticipate when a fight is going to happen, right? And even if you don't know for sure, if you suspect something, you can always go into turn-based mode, 
buff yourself up, cast shillelagh, cast bless, etc., and then start the conversation. If things go south, you'll start the fight buffed and ready to go, with all of your actions and bonus actions available. It's wonderful. Anyways, Yes, thanks to Shillelagh, we can now be a strength-ignoring, wisdom-focused barbarian, eventually, and still do respectable damage. So awesome. At level 2, we get Wild Shape, of course, we've already discussed this. Subclass, yes, we're going Spores. So yeah, Halo of Spores. Eh. Symbiotic Entity. Ding. Neither of those things really change for us. But once we've gotten to Spores Druid, yes, let's jump over to Barbarian here. At level 3, we'd be a Barbarian 1 so that we can start increasing those attack capabilities, as well as give us a way to to help those temporary hit points last a little longer. So at Barbarian 1, we get Unarmored Defense, first of all, which causes our armor class to be 10 plus our dexterity and constitution modifiers if we're not wearing any armor. For us at this level, that would be a 15. So we're likely better off if we can just find some good medium armor, which will still let us add two from our dexterity. And I mean, we only have a plus two right now anyways. That said, I will mention, there is some really great just like clothing in BG3 that's not technically armor, but can still buff your stats and even in some cases your armor class. If you can find that, and especially if you've got access to some great constitution and or dexterity buffing equipment, you could just wear some robes or other clothes and have an AC well over 20. And that's just super fun and awesome. But then we also at this level get rage. So yes, like I've said, as long as the attack is made with a melee or thrown weapon, we enter rage with a bonus action, and we can't do this until after combat has started, unfortunately. But while raging, as long as we're making attacks with a melee or thrown weapon, we get an extra plus two damage to the attack. But then we also have resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which yes, like I often say, is most of the damage that we'll be taking in the game. And yeah, this is a big key for us to holding on to those precious symbiotic entity temporary hit points. Those eight temporary hit points that we have at the moment are more like 16 for us. And at level three, that's a ton of hit points. Now, of course, the big drawback here is that we can't cast or concentrate on spells while raging, and for someone who's partially at least a support character, that's a big bummer, no question. There are some good spells we'll get access to that last a long time and don't require concentration though, and we'll also have all that wonderful support and utility available to us between combat encounters or maybe at the beginning of a combat encounter, before we rage, we can still cast a spell, right? And of course, if we really need to drop rage to cast a super important spell, like if an ally is about to die and we're the only ones who can get a healing spell off on them or something, that said, you can throw healing potions in this game. And if you target the area right next to your ally, it'll heal them when it lands, right? In, in a small AOE, so it could potentially heal multiple allies. Making in this game healing word a lot less powerful than it is in D&D, but anyway. Sometimes you might want to drop rage to cast a spell. At level four, we would be a barbarian too. And that means we get danger sense, first of all, which gives us basically advantage on our dexterity saving throws. But more importantly, we get Reckless Attack, which is really the Barbarian's strongest feature, I think. It grants advantage on our attacks just at will. Though it does come at a drawback too, and it's that enemies will have advantage on their attacks against us when we use Reckless Attack, right? And frankly, as someone who's super concerned about holding on to our temporary hit points in order to keep our damage up, it does make Reckless Attack a little bit less of a no-brainer than it is for most Barbarians. One great thing about how it works in Baldur's Gate, though, is that you can wait to decide to use it until you've seen that you've missed. So there are going to be plenty of times that you just don't even need it, helping us then hold on to those temporary hit points a little bit better. At level 5, we would be a Barbarian 3, and that means we get our Barbarian subclass, and I want to go Berserker here. You were probably thinking Bear Totem, I'll bet, or Wild Heart. It's not a bad option. Having resistance to everything but psychic damage is really nice, but honestly, just having resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage is like 70 to 80 percent of damage, if not more. And as we discussed in the Eldritch Knight build, we really want to be able to attack with our bonus action. And Polar Master, sadly, does not apply symbiotic entity damage, and dual wielding doesn't work because Shillelagh only works on a single staff, right? At least, I think so. I didn't actually test that. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong on that front, but I'm pretty sure it's just one staff. And so that makes dual wielding staves out, and also we really want a shield to be harder to hit, so yeah, I think Berserker is our best option here. Because Berserkers get the Frenzy ability, which tells us that when we rage, we can now make another weapon attack with our bonus action thanks to Frenzied Strike. Yeah, there's also the enraged throw option here that I made use of in the, my Carlac build, on this video, but yeah, we're not throwing stuff today. So Frenzied Strike is fantastic, but 
as with most things barbarian, it comes with a cost. In this case, using Frenzied Strike gives us a debuff that decreases our hit chance by one every time we use it until we stop raging, it stacks. But honestly, after playing this game for several months now, I'm a lot less worried about this debuff than I was back when I first started playing. There are just so many great ways to increase hit chance in this game via magic items, buffs, and especially for us, advantage, thanks to Reckless Attack, that before long, we almost never miss, even with a minor debuff. And most combat encounters only last three to four rounds, so that debuff just really never gets high enough to be a huge nuisance, I don't think, especially since we're raging on round one with our bonus action, right? At level six, we would be a Barbarian four, and that means we get a feat, and we definitely want to be bumping our wisdom, since that's going to add to our damage, our hit chance, and our spells and healing and other druid things. At level seven, we'd be a Barbarian five, and that means, yes, we finally get extra attack. Yeah, it's a couple levels later than we would otherwise have been able to get it, but getting a little bonus damage from Symbiotic Entity to our two attacks per turn in the meantime has made delaying extra attack feel a little less painful, especially since we're adding rage and we can get advantage on demand. But at level eight, with extra attack finally secured, I think we go back to Druid and really try to pump those temporary hit points and Druid spell capabilities as much as we possibly can from here on out. That means we'd be a Druid 3 and we get second level spells. That's gonna get us like lesser restoration for a nice cure all, pass without a trace for a great party-wide stealth buff. The one I want to at least dive into here is Flame Blade. Man, this is just one of those spells that I want so badly to be cool, but it's just like this close, you know? I've never used it in a D&D &D build before, despite countless requests to do so, but I want to at least consider it here. It, Flame Blade works like Shadow Blade, for those familiar with that spell, in that it just summons a blade made of magic into our hand. In this case, it's a scimitar made of fire, and man, if nothing else, it looks so awesome in-game. It's got kind of this jagged edge on the back, and the flames are coming off it. But anyways, this blade does 3d6 damage on a hit, and yes, uses our wisdom modifier for the hit chance. Now, in D&D, the spell is particularly bad because the wording is such that we don't take the attack action with it, meaning it doesn't benefit from extra attack. We specifically use our action to make a melee spell attack with it. So no more than once per turn unless we have action surge or something. In Baldur's Gate 3 it works better in that yeah it's basically just a weapon and you can use it whenever you make a weapon attack. Opportunity attacks, frenzied attack from Berserker Barbarian, extra attack, and best of all in BG3 it doesn't require concentration like it does in D&D. So yes we could totally use it on our Raging Barbarian here. Sweet! 3d6 damage Pretty nice for a weapon. Better even than a 2d6 greatsword, and it's only a one-hander. But there are problems. First of all, it doesn't add our wisdom modifier to the damage. It just uses it to calculate the hit chance. That's giving up a plus five on every hit. So like the equivalent of about a d8. What's more, at the time of this recording anyways, it's broken in the game in that it's not adding our rage damage to the attack either. That in and of itself isn't huge, but it means using Flame Blade instead of a staff, I mean, the staff with Shillelagh is gonna give us a D8 plus seven, or 11.5 on average, as opposed to a flat 3D6 with Flame Blade for 10.5, meh. Now, Flame Blade does scale up to 4D6 per swing if you cast it with a fourth level spell slot, which we will get to eventually but, I mean, yeah, considering all the really great magical staves that exist in-game, it's hard to imagine it ever really being worth using Flame Blade instead. And that makes me really sad. Larian, please, you've buffed so many things in this game. Give Flame Blade a little love. Let it scale a little better. Maybe every spell level, and then work properly. Maybe add our wisdom modifier to the damage. Okay, thanks. Anyways, at level 9, we would be a Druid 4, and that means we get another feat. I think I'd probably just bump Constitution at this point, giving a nice bump to our health and saving throws. Let me know if you feel strongly about taking something else here at this point, down in the comments. Sentinel, again, not a bad option here either. Maybe even more so on this character, since we're not going to be casting shield, right? At level 10, we would be a Druid 5, and that means we get third level spells. And while there are lots of great options to choose from, I want to highlight a couple here. First up, Plant Growth. I don't talk about this spell that much, but it's really a pretty great control debuff option. It lasts for a minute, but it doesn't require concentration, so potentially something you could cast before raging at the beginning of combat, right? And it reduces enemy movement to one quarter in a 20-foot radius area. 
it's unfortunate that it's not bigger. In D&D, it's a massive 100 foot radius. But still, for enemies stuck inside the area, even if they dash, most enemies are only moving 15 feet on their turn. Depending on the battlefield, that could effectively remove multiple enemies potentially from combat for a round or two without giving them any saving throw or anything. In addition, Spore's Druids specifically get the Animate Dead spell, which lets you raise up a skeleton or a zombie to fight for you. I'd probably go skeletons here because they get a bow and can make ranged attacks helping them stay safer. But the great thing about how summons work in BG3 is that they share your initiative and they always just do what you want them to do without costing any of your actions or even your concentration. Animate Dead basically works that way in D&D too, but most of the summons require more from you. And this is perfect for our raging barbarian selves. Something else not to be overlooked with summoned creatures and pets, even if they aren't super strong, the fact that they can potentially cause an enemy to spend their actions and resources taking out the pet or the summon instead of you and your party is valuable in and of itself. And this actually is the beginning of what can become like a little walking menagerie option with Spores Druid. Because at level 11, we'd be a Druid 6, and as a Spores Druid, that means we get Fungal Infestation, which lets us, four times per day, using our reaction, raise a fungal zombie from the corpse of a beast or a humanoid. Now, again, these zombies aren't particularly amazing. They don't hit very hard, they're fairly squishy, but in true Last of Us style, if they hit an enemy, it'll infect them with spores that will cause that enemy to potentially be raised as a zombie when they die. Meaning that you can potentially get yourself like a little army of undead here, especially if you've got a skelly or two already in tow, right? And this can be a lot of fun. Also at this level, Halo of Spores goes up to a D6 of damage or 2D6 when your symbiotic entity is up, right? And I mean, that's still not great, but I guess, sure, on this build, it might be a little more worth using. Depending on if you have Sentinel or not, depending on whether you have fungal infestation charges available, how often you think you might get an opportunity attack otherwise, etc. I mean, we've got a great wisdom score here, so it's less likely to be resisted. It's not a lot of damage, but sometimes a little bit is all you need. But finally, at level 12, we would be a Druid 7, and that means 4th level Druid spells. And so freedom of movement is a great like non-concentration option. It keeps us from being impacted by difficult terrain or from being slowed or paralyzed or even restrained in really any way. And it lasts all day. Man, I love that. Not a bad spell. However, druids also get a couple of really potent summoning spells at this level, letting us build up our little army even more. Conjure Minor Elemental lets us summon basically like a fire, ice, or earth pet that can do some damage, maybe throw out a debuff, potentially restrain enemies depending on which one you summon, but I think I'm an even bigger fan of Conjure Woodland Being. This gives us a dryad that can throw down spike growth. Combine that with plant growth for some intense slowing, or just use both to cover like a bigger area on the battlefield, right? And this dryad does decent damage on her own. She can cast Shillelagh herself, but her Shillelagh is like super Shillelagh. I think it makes her weapon hit for 4d8. She can entangle enemies, and she can even summon yet another creature herself, a little wood woad. So you could potentially, by end game, game here be running around with a skeleton or two, a zombie or four or more, a dryad, and a woodwode. I actually did have all of these up in test at one point and it made me feel like I could pretty easily solo the game. In the end, I love the versatility of this build. Its damage is about on par with Eldritch Knight. I mean, we're trading in large reduce damage from Eldritch Knight for rage damage. It's almost the same. But here we get on-demand advantage. And while we're definitely easier to hit, we've got way more temporary hit points and resistance to most damage as well. Meaning that those temporary hit points, I think, are more likely to stick around on this build than they are in the Eldritch Knight version. We also get a lot of great support and utility options. And that really fun late game potential to be like a walking army. Couple of spores druid with a necromancer, and we might be the ultimate summoner. I actually outlined a build along those lines, but we're not getting into it today because that is all we have time for. Despite the potential weaknesses of spores druid, I think that you can find really fun ways to play with it and make it work. So let me know your favorite way to play with mushrooms in the comments down below. What did I miss? Regardless, I hope you guys know how much I love you. 
thank you for all of your support, everything that you do for me for this channel. Especially thank you to my channel members. I could not do this without you guys. If you're interested in becoming one, uh, there's a button down there that says join. It's just a dollar or two a month and can potentially get you access to my library of write-ups that I make for each of these builds. It's like a cheat sheet so that you don't have to go back and re-watch the video or take notes if you want to like build the character yourself in game, right? Anyways, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider it, but even if you're not interested in that, that's okay. I still hope you have a great day anyways, and a great week, and that you be kind and do good, and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye. When I'm walking by the water, splish splash, me and you taking a bath. When I'm walking by the water Comes up through my toes To my ankles To my head To my soul I'm blown away <laughs> And I can't believe that we would lie in our graves Wondering if we Had spent our living days well I can't believe that we would lie in our graves Dreaming of things that we might have been where's my 90s kids at come on don't give me a hard time dave matthews band they are incredibly talented musicians regardless of what you think of their music so i don't want to hear it come on light a little closer to the ship why are you afraid of shepherd she's amazing best protagonist in all of video game history as far as i'm concerned Oh, excuse me. I almost forgot my favorite thing about Halo of Spores in Bald... Er, no, 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 not Halo of Spores. Blah, 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 blah. Bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> forgot to put on my wedding ring. I was feeling a little naked without it. I think that's how it works in Baldur's Gate anyway. All right. How's it going? How shiny is my forehead? Answer. So shiny. <laughs> I need to start getting, like, some some powder, some makeup. And that's not worse, actually. That's only two instead of five. <laughs> but, dang it, lost my momentum. I actually outlined a build along those lines. <laughs>